Hello everyone and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. Uh, my name is Mark Richards and in this lesson number 162 uh, we'll continue with our journey of looking at the various architecture styles but this time focusing on the microservices architecture style. You can get a listing of all the lessons I do on Software Architecture Monday at my website developer2architect.com slash lessons. I showed you this roadmap when we were looking at all the monolithic architecture styles. And then we, on the last lesson, kind of took a little break to kind of clarify some of the, well, questions that came up about agility and monolithic architecture styles. But now we're going to continue our journey with all of these distributed architecture styles and specifically focus on microservices. Microservices architecture style is the newest and youngest architecture style out of all the ones we're going to be looking at. As of the date of this recording, it's really only been popularized and coined in about the past 10, 11 years. Uh, but microservices can be best described as single purpose functions deployed as separate units of software with each owning its own data. And that's the overall shape of what microservices architecture is all about. And so let me explain some of the core concepts before we dive into its strengths and weaknesses. Client requests come into some sort of API layer or API gateway that fronts separately deployed services, and as I mentioned, all owning their own data. Now, what I'm showing here is each service has its own separate database. Uh, that may be possible, but what we're really talking about with microservices is each service formally needs to own its own data tables that it actually writes to. Now these tables can all be put into a separate schema like this that's in sort of some sort of highly reliable domain-based database um, or uh, each service could have its own separate physical and database. Um, because this is most typical from a concept standpoint I'm going to leave the tables there to say each service is the owner of those tables. In other words, the only one that could actually get access to read or write from those particular tables. Those are owned by the service. Before we actually launch into microservices, let's actually define what a service actually is. A service in microservices is single purpose, separately deployed unit of software that does one thing really well. And that's the term micro. That's where microservices actually gets its name. And not from the physical size of a service, um, but rather what the service does. Now, one concept before we kind of launch into when to use and not to use this is probably one of the most important concepts in microservices. And that is the bounded context, which forms what's called a sheer nothing architecture. Uh, that bounded context binds together uh, the service functionality along with its corresponding data. Therefore, we have this ownership structure of the service owning that data and those particular data structures. And that's what's known as kind of a bounded context specifically within uh, microservices. Now, that becomes incredibly significant because with the bounded context, which is necessary in microservices, it's mostly there to facilitate change. Because I'm the sole owner of my data, that allows me to change those underlying data structures without impacting any other service. You see, services who want my data have to go and actually ask me for that data. And this is in a separate contract. And so the manifestation or representation of how I store data and those corresponding data structures are only own and known by me, the owning service. And that is one of the most important concepts in microservices. Can you imagine if you had several hundred services all querying and accessing a table, and then you change that schema or change the structure of that table? Uh, you've now impacted several hundred services. And those are only the ones you know about. Because once we do that data migration, and release that, I could possibly break other services that I didn't know about. Okay, so 
in keeping with kind of the pattern that we've done before, uh, let's talk about when it's good to use microservices. And you can kind of see from our star ratings, again, one star is not well supported, five stars is very well supported. You can kind of see now uh, the story is much different than our prior three architectures, isn't it? Especially when we take a look at some of these operational and process characteristics. As a matter of fact, this really points to when to use microservices. Now we start to see that agility, that ability to respond quickly to change that I talked about in the prior lesson, microservices does extremely well. Five stars on that. Especially aspects of scalability or elasticity. And because of the fine-grained nature of these services, uh, their mean time to start and mean time to recovery is very, 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 very fast. Uh, we're talking in, in hundreds of milliseconds time. Also, another time to use this is when we have really high fault tolerance needs. When, not if, but when errors occur, uh, certain services might not, be uh, might not be available, but other services are. So we can continue with some of our work. And furthermore, because of the fine-grained nature of these services, that mean time to recovery, MTTR, is very, very, very fast. Uh, which means that in many cases in microservices, a lot of end users don't actually know that a fault occurred. Another good time to use this is for cloud-based deployments, which this, this is such, such a natural fit uh, for that on-demand provisioning of services, of storage, of networks, um, all that kind of capability that's built into cloud-based uh, deployments. Well, with all of these five star ratings right here and these kind of use cases, uh, is there any time not to use microservices? And as a matter of fact, there are. Microservices is not a good choice when we have large monolithic data, especially relational data, that we can't break apart. Because we must form those bounded contexts to make microservices work, by necessity, we have to break apart our data. And a lot of times that's not feasible. Now in the next lesson, I'm going to show you a hybrid of microservices where we can get away without having to touch or break apart our data. But in microservices, we do. Um, if we've got tight time and budget constraints, uh, this is probably not a good architecture choice for that initial startup of the system. Isn't this interesting? This is exactly backwards of the monolithic applications I talked about. If you're confused about this, then go back to lesson 161, where I kind of explain this difference and I illustrate how with a highly distributed architecture, like microservices, uh, this is not well suited for initial cost and simplicity uh, for an initial start. But the agility piece, the time to market, is good. Also, if our team structure is organized by technical layers, in other words, uh, whether it's agile teams or not, but if our teams are groups of UI developers, groups of backend developers, groups of database engineers, uh, groups of shared services people, uh, this does not fit well with the domain partitioning part of microservices. So this is kind of an oil and water mixture to be very careful about. And there's one other time not to use microservices. And that's when we have highly semantically coupled functionality. What that means, and I did a lesson on this prior, but what this really means is that uh, to execute any kind of business function uh, or business request, I need a lot of different functionality. And if I put that functionality, single purpose, into separately deployed units of software, then I am making inner service calls everywhere. And I end up with what formally is called a big ball of distributed mud. And that's a lot of where kind of the performance aspect of microservices comes in. Uh, that inner service communication that does occur naturally in microservices, uh, 
does impact performance and responsiveness. And as a matter of fact, it's due to three kinds of latency. I have network latency when I go over to a particular service. If that endpoint is secure, I've got security latency. So I'm going to label this one uh, M N for network. <laughs> then I've got security latency, the time it takes to end up uh, authenticating or reauthorizing most, most typically that particular request. But then I've got another form of latency, and that's data latency. Because you see, in any given request, I'm invoking the database or database calls multiple times. Whereas in our monolithic systems or monolithic data, it's only a single query typically. OK, so that is the summary of microservices you could see over here, uh, where I've kind of outlined a lot of the actual strengths and weaknesses in our star ratings, with again, one star being not well supported, five stars being pretty well supported. Look at the number of five stars here, and you can see why. Microservices is pretty high on the popularity curve and also trending. However, um, just be aware of some of the things that it's not really good at. And those are the trade-offs to really avoid, especially in terms of the things I talked about when not to use microservices. All right, well, this has been Lesson 162 in our journey of architecture styles, microservices architecture. In our next lesson, Lesson 163, we're going to take a look at a hybrid of microservices called service-based architecture. We're going to see how that works, when to use it, and also when not to use that architecture style. So until then, um, enjoy, and we'll see all of you in two weeks for our next lesson.